Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number two. Uh, this is the Great Displacement Current Caper. This is a redo of the original video that was made a couple years back. Uh, this is intended for scientists and engineers, but I'm going to uh, show examples and analogies that will make it more understandable by people that aren't familiar with the terms that are being used. Uh, this video shows that Maxwell's displacement current term is gibberish, and consequently the plane wave equation is bunk. Now, wh why is the plane wave equation important? The plane wave equation has been our understanding of what light and radio waves are, and I'm going to show you that that understanding is completely baseless. This is a redo of a previous uh, version of this video. It is through discussions with people on the YouTube site, it's making me look at this video again, uh, and then re-looking at it again, I realized that the two independent things I came up with, the overunity and the dipole experiment, that I can put them together and it actually dovetails to a much more powerful argument that Maxwell's plane wave derivation is, is complete garbage. Placement current is what the assumption that James Clerk Maxwell made in order to unify electricity with mag magnetism. And what he did is, this is, placement current term is this guy here. Because before Maxwell did this, there was just this, which was Ampere circuital law. And I use law in quotes because we really shouldn't be calling mathematical models laws. They're not laws. They weren't handed to us by God on stone tablets. Okay, they're just ability as humans to mimic nature with mathematics. That's all they are, is mimics of nature. And this is what Ampere circuital law said. And then in order for Maxwell to make the plane wave equation, which was the model for light, he needed to add this displacement current term. And by addition of this, okay, and this is now all of Maxwell's equations. He's given credit for all of these, but in fact, the only addition to these equations is this. The addition of this allows these, if this were true, and I'm going to show you that this is false, but if this were true, it allowed that these two equations on the bottom could be inserted into what's called known as Helmholtz equation, which is a wave equation, and be able to describe light as a, an electromagnetic field phenomenon. Again, if this term is false, the whole derivation is false. So what is displacement current? This is Maxwell's thought experiment, and it's basically just if you put two capacitive plates around a loop of wire, which is an inductor, so you have an inductor and a capacitor in series. This is what Maxwell used to make the assumption of displacement current. What, what, did, what, is, that, what is displacement current? Well, if you take electric charge from plate A, and it goes through the wire, I'm showing it outside for the case of simplicity, to, from plate A to plate B. Well, what Maxwell did is he put an imaginary barrier, and I'll show that with magenta, between the plates, and said, well, what happens to the electric flux on those plates? and there's electric flux lines that cross that um, imaginary barrier. And he found by doing some mathematical calculations that the amount of flux chain, dd, dt, was equal to j. In other words, the number of flux lines that cut that imaginary barrier were equal to the current in the wire. And so he called that the displacement current. And what I'm showing you here, these are the point forms of Maxwell's equations. The point forms and the integral forms basically tell the same story. All right, so if we take a look at what's going on at this capacitor plate in more detail, now with our knowledge of electrons, here's our imaginary magenta line. It didn't quite come out magenta in the printer. And here is the capacitive plates, and here is a section of the wire. We're just looking at this little section here. And you notice that matter is composed of equal number of positive and negative charges. Well, what happens when you start moving current around the loop this way is that this charge from this atom is going to uncover that positive, electro, uh, positive charge and it's going to move to the right. And that's going to push the next one and the next one all the way around until when you get around to this side, this electron that was here gets bumped off and pushed into the capacitor and it, these two Un this uncovered charge with this bumped off electron make a connection across the, uh, the gap in the capacitor. And so what you have is you have the, the forward arrows from the electron and you have the return from the positive charge uh, going across the imaginary barrier. And so you have, and we're going to call the negative we're going to call the electrons the positive here, and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, po the uh, positive charge is the negative here. So you have one of these plus a negative going the other way, which is positive 2. 
Okay, because when you add a positive and a negative going the other way, because that's a negative charge, or it's the opposite charge, you get a, a net addition of two. Now you say, well, we're getting twice. Now, the way physics has worked this, they've worked out that uh, this is all normalized, so this really only counts as one. Okay, that's all been normalized. And I can do a whole video on that. That's, you know, pretty straightforward stuff. It's just the way we normalize stuff to make it simpler. So you have to carry two all over the place. All right, so, so then what Maxwell deduced is he came up with that the current in the wire, the amount of charge that moves is similar to the change in flux lines across the gap. And therefore, we have the magnetic field contributed by the current in the wire, and then we have the magnetic field contributed by the change in electric flux across the gap. And so it doesn't matter where you are if you have the current here, which is represented by J here, and the changing electric field across the gap, it doesn't matter where you are in the loop, you get the same contribution in magnetic field. Okay, but there's a problem here. If you were able to draw this imaginary line here, you have a current that passes that line, but there's also magnetic fields, oh, wrong color, there's also magnetic field contributions to that, what's going across that barrier. So if the current causes a magnetic field and the change in electric flux lines causes a magnetic field, that's what Maxwell said, then we should have a contribution from the magnetic flux lines. Um, sorry, we should have a contribution from the changing electric flux lines as well. Okay, and we're going to look at that on this page here. We're going to show you that. So here's an imaginary barrier. We're putting it somewhere else. It could be anywhere along the loop. We're showing it right over here. I picked an arbitrary spot. So as this electron moves to the right, okay, right now, before it moves, it's got three uh, field lines cutting the imaginary barrier. As it moves to the right, a fourth one will eventually cut the barrier. So the amount of electric flux lines that have changed as that electron moved went from three positive to four positive. And I'm showing it this way instead of with angles. So the addition is a plus one. Okay, but what about the charge that's moving to the right, that's, that's receding to the right from that barrier? Well, it's also going to start with three, but these three go this way. And as it moves to the right, eventually one of those is going to slide off, and then you end up with this, just two. Okay, so what we've had is we had a neg negation of one of these, which is the same as an addition of one of these. So again, we end up with a plus two. We get one from the charge moving to the right, one going from the charge to the left, and like I said, because we've normalized everything, that counts as one. And if we do just a simple derivation using Gauss's law, which says that the charge density, and I put that there to remind myself, because when I did the, the video last time, I kept saying current density, it's charge density, is the divergence of the electric field lines D. And just so you know, in, in, electric, in, in, in electromagnetism, E and D are pretty much the same thing. They're only off by a constant. And H and B are the same thing. Pretty again, only off by a constant. It makes electromagnetic physics so unnecessarily confusing. It's really, uh, it's really a pain in the neck. And it, I'm doing away with it because it's ridiculous. There's no need for this extra variables to confuse things. Okay, but getting back to this. The divergence of the electric field lines okay, gives you the charge density within that little finite. And we're doing everything again with point laws. You can do it with the integral laws. You'll get the same answer. I have that derivation on a paper somewhere. I'll put the link to it if I remember to do that. So this divergence, this whole thing is just a, uh, a fancy uh, simplified notation for this, which is the partial derivative of the flux lines along x, the partial derivative of the flux lines along y, and the partial derivative of the flux lines along z. But since we're, we're concerning ourselves, we're going to simplify this because we're only doing stuff along the x direction here. We're just going to look at this term right now. Okay, we're, We can ignore these for now, but we'll include them back in at the end. We're just going to simplify the derivation just by looking in the x dimension right now. All right, so if we take that um, partial derivative and we multiply using the g 
chain rule of differential calculus and multiply both sides by partial derivative of x with respect to t. Okay, then this cancels with this. And then we're left with the charge density times the velocity is equal to a displacement current or a, a, a time changing uh, electric field fl flux lines. Okay, but this, a current times a velocity is essentially, I'm sorry, a charge, a charge density times a velocity is eventually essentially a current density in x. And therefore, if this is true for x, it's true for all the dimensions, and so we can write this in general terms here. Which says to us that the changing electric field around a current is equal to this quantity here. So, if Maxwell said that a magnetic field is the contribution of both the current and the changing electric field in the area, and because we just showed that the changing electric field around a current is this, then we can substitute J in here, and then we come up with the final equation that the magnetic field contribution by a closed loop, we don't need to look at the capacitor, just the closed loop, is twice the current, which is over unity. Okay, this is unacceptable. And so, so which is it? Is the magnetic field on the wire caused by the motion of the charges? Or is the magnetic field caused by the changing electric field lines? And this should be the partial. Or it can't be both, because if it were both, we'd get over unity for, for a solid loop of wire. And we know we can't get over unity. We, get, we can only get the magnetic field once. And, and the way we can solve this is to use Maxwell's own thought experiment to show us the way. That if we take and we move a current around the loop, okay, we are going to get a displacement current in the same direction that goes completely around the loop. Okay, and I'm showing it outside the wire. This actually occurs in the wire or the capacitive plate. Okay, again, here's where we get the 2J. The magnetic field contribution is 2J if Maxwell is right. So if we take this loop and we open it up and we draw it this way, well, if we put, pull current from A to B, real current, that means our displacement current has to go up and then it has to close, coming back. Okay, now, if we fashion these electric plates into the radiators of a dipole antenna and we move current from A to B, that means we get a displacement current this way with the current and we get the closing displacement current across the capacitive coupling from the two points of the dipole. So, right here we can determine, since dipoles do work, and if the magnetic field is caused by either the displacement current or the real current, it can only be the displacement current or the current, it can't be both, we're causing the magnetic field. And since a dipole does radiate, we need something to cause a magnetic field as part of the radiation. Now, if a displacement current causes the magnetic field, well then we got one displacement current going positive and one displacement current going negative. Therefore, there's no net displacement current in a dipole. And if, so therefore, if the displacement current, in fact, was the cause of a magnetic field, the dipole wouldn't radiate. Therefore, it's only the real current that causes the magnetic field, not the displacement current. Otherwise, a dipole would not radiate. So the changing electric field lines, aka the displacement current, does not cause a magnetic field. And therefore, the plane wave derivation that we've relied on as the true model of light is a fraud. And however, though, where there is a changing electric field lines, there are charges in motion. And since charges in motion do cause magnetic fields, then you will always find a changing electric field and H in the presence of a moving charge. And let me show you the next page for analogy of what, how Maxwell made the mistake. This is a problem with the mathematics. Okay, let's say we use the analogy of smoke and fire and heat. Okay, where there, fire causes smoke, and that's the same thing as saying that J is equal to uh, the curl uh, makes a magnetic field, that the current density makes a magnetic field. Okay, and now we could say, well, where there is fire, there is also heat. So fire causes heat. 
and we can also say that J causes DD DT. So if we were to do what Maxwell did and put these two equations together, okay, we would get curl cross H equals DD DT, and that's the same thing as putting these two equations together and saying smoke causes heat. And there's where, there's where we get the problem, okay, is we're saying here that since the, it's only the current that causes these things, and if we put the current together, we could make the false assumption that the two products of current cause each other, and that's where the flaw is. That's the same thing as saying that smoke causes heat, because if you go on with this analogy, if both fire and smoke cause heat, then fire should be twice as hot, and that's the mistake we got before with the overunity. Okay, but since smoke and heat is always present about fire, it's easy to make this mistake of causality. So we're, this, we're going to be revising the rules of acquisition. We're adding rule of, or replacing rule of acquisition 12 with mathematics without logic is alchemy. Math has unresolved flaws and ambiguities. Math needs to be constrained by logic and reason. And what we can do here is if we were to put a particular symbol here that fire causes smoke and fire causes heat, then if you try to put these together, you would get something like this, which would say that's not workable because you're missing the cause. And we, so we're going to add symbols to mathematics to infer the causality so you don't get these bad causal relationships and fraudulent derivations, which Maxwell has. And I've seen this a lot in engineering where young engineers will come in and just start throwing down equations and massaging them and assuming, well, if they get this, it must be the right answer because they did all the math right. Okay, and that's why we have the new rule of acquisition 13. Derivations are not proof because math is a superset of nature. It's possible to derive many things that don't exist in nature. I mean, math allows you to have over unity and parallel dimensions and, and infinity where it's possible that nothing is infinite and that over unity doesn't exist. So just because you can derive it doesn't mean it exists. And derivations need to be verified by observation. Okay, so recap. We demonstrated that a changing electric field cannot directly cause a magnetic field. This is the basis of Maxwell's plane wave derivation. Thus, the accepted model for light and radio waves are bunk. The goal of ethereal mechanics new electromagnetism is to provide a better wave model for light, and imp improvements to mathematics are also in the works. Finally, just a note. Uh, Maxwell's equations are so poorly understood, even by experts, and too often abuse that they are actually worthless. Uh, worse, they do not accurately predict observed phenomena in certain cases involving magnetic field. And I've developed neural magnetism many years ago in order to eliminate the ambiguity and correct the mismatch between experiment and theory. But it's not the final story, because as you keep going down the deeper down the rabbit hole, I like finding more and more stuff that's wrong. Thank you, and uh, all you engineers uh, will be turning in your James Clerk Maxwell with the Kung Fu right hand rule grip. Uh, so market prices of these are going to be going down. Thank you very much.